welcome to the bookshelf. It's really good to have you on. Thank you for, for letting me interview you. So, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you pretty well. It's a little echoey, and I'm very deaf. I'm very not really not good with my ears. So, if I don't understand something, be prepared for me to say what. <laughs> okay. Yes, I remember reading about that. Um, so, basically, uh, most of my viewers will not have heard of Rising in Love, and so I'm just going to say that this is a book. This is we're interviewing. We're interviewing today. We're interviewing Ramdas. Bachelder today about Rising in Love, which is a book about Ama, the hugging nun uh, in India, and about his experiences, his journey um, as one of her disciples, but also his whole journey before he actually arrived there, and which is absolutely fascinating. And just very quickly, um, it's got five stars on Amazon, is that right? Well, yes, it's, a, it's got a five-star rating. It's got 63 five-star reviews on Amazon. Wow. And so pe people are really loving it, and it's selling very well. That is wonderful. And uh, our own Russell Brand <laughs> has actually given it um, a review. Um, beautiful book by an adorable lunatic about the incomparable Alma. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah, I'm flattered to be called an adorable devoted lunatic like Russell Brand. <laughs> well, I love the references that you make to us lunatics, uh, us people with mental health problems. And I love the way that you, you said that actually in the Eastern world, uh, people who start to have visions and see God everywhere and hear voices are told to go to an ashram and, and uh, meditate and get a guru. But unfortunately, in the Western world, uh, where half the population are being told that they're mad and being put on drugs and s stuck into asylums. So um, yeah. I didn't know that about the Eastern world, but I think it's really, really important to highlight that uh, in the interview. So okay. tell us about the book. Um, it's Mark, isn't it? Or do you go by the name Ramdas? <laughs> Well, actually, yeah, I go by the name Ramdas. Everyone, including the grandparents, call, calls me Ramdas these days. They call um, you Ramdas these days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, tell us about the book, because, mo as I say, most of my viewers are not uh, aware of the book yet. And I think it would be wonderful if you could just give us a general idea for them. Well, it's, it's my autobiography, really, but the main focus is on my years with Amma. The Hugging Saints, who I met in 1987, and um, it also has a, a substantial section, as you mentioned, about the years before I met Anna, when um, I had a very powerful and profound spiritual awakening, but I didn't know anything about spirituality at the time, mm -hmm. and so I, you know, I went from in my views, at the, and when I was about 20, 21, to suddenly hearing God's voice, discovering that God was real, and mm -hmm. uh, becoming quite deluded about it. Um, you know, I was actually smoking heaps of marijuana, that was my primary spiritual path at the time, and um, I, it was very, very powerful for me. It's not, this is not a pro-drug book. Um, it also, the, the fact that I was using marijuana drove me very close to insane, so I, I finally had to quit completely. But um, in those days, when I would smoke marijuana, I would have these very profound experiences and, and a direct communion with God, and, and even, um, I, guess, I guess it was the Kundalini was rising in a certain kind of way that I would glow with the visible light, that people who had never before seen an aura would see a glow around me. And mm. so, and um, this was very exciting for my ego. I thought I was something very special. Yes. In fact, for a while, I thought I was a messiah. But this yeah. is because I had an experience of meeting an angel, and God was speaking to me, and I was glowing with a visible light. I mean, what else could it be? I had no other possible explanation. And largely, that is because of, you could say, the stupidity of my upbringing. Uh, or just you can say the, the cultural ignorance, you know, in, in the culture I grew up in, um, 
we didn't know anything about saints. I didn't know anything about enlightenment. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the whole spiritual path was completely hidden from me. And so when I started having these extremely powerful experiences, I didn't have any other context mm -hmm. to put it in, other than the Messiah story, which I had learned in church, of course, but um, had you know rejected along with everything else I heard in church. Um, but suddenly, the reality of it was hitting me over the head with just uh, like a ton of bricks, and so um, I became quite confused and deluded, and I went through a couple of years um, of, you know, kind of borderline craziness of uh, seriously uh, on a manic phase, you could say, where I thought I was the Messiah, and then I went mm -hmm. through a couple of very serious depressions also, yes. where the, the Messiah illusion fell away, and I plummeted into the, the despair of, oh my God, what have I done with my life? I thought I was completely insane. I thought I was the Messiah. What kind of idiot must I be? I saw myself through the eyes of, of my parents and other people who thought, wow, so crazy. And suddenly mm -hmm. I realized, oh my god, I did go crazy, what a horrible fate this is, what an idiot I am. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, then and then after walking through very intense depression for some six months, coming right back out of it into another Messiah phase where the divine energy had come upon me again and um, <laughs> it was quite something to live through that. Well, but, uh, but you know, by the grace of God I did live through it and didn't end up killing myself and, and discovered meditation. Yes. And when, once I discovered meditation, which I didn't, you know, I didn't take a course in it. I just somebody just said, "Oh, we have a meditation room here. Why don't you give it a try?" And I just sat down and, and very quickly discovered, "Oh my God, this is fantastic! Mm -hmm. I don't need marijuana anymore." Yeah, I, that I, I, Very work. quickly, my delusion yes. fell away. When I once I quit smoking marijuana, and I got established on a, in a spiritual practice. Which was simple meditation. I would just sit and pray and close my eyes and just watch what would happen in my body and my mind would become quite deeply centered in God and I would have beautiful experiences. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, finally I've got it. And then I discovered, uh, very soon thereafter, I discovered books about the saints of India. Um, for instance, Be Here Now by the American Ram Dass, the more famous one. Yeah, um, but you said he came to your college when you were younger, yeah. but you had absolutely no interest in spirituality at all. Not at all when I was Nothing. younger. And I rejected it, I thought it was baloney. In fact, the same Ram Dass, the guy who's now in a wheelchair, he came to my college when I was there, and I was like, I couldn't care less, I don't know what that crap is, but it's baloney as far as I can tell, and I didn't even go. <laughs> Actually, the, your book is very funny. And the way you describe uh, all the things you got up to when you were young, you know, uh, putting the string across the road and, you know, and stuff like that, and urinating yeah. and then getting beaten up and mooning and stuff like that. And oh, yeah. All, you know, there's li little anecdotes to um, how uh, you were I was as a, a kid. Very, very, <laughs> I was a very ordinary young American boy, you know, <laughs> and most of my mind was about sex and mischief. You know, I was, I was not, there was nothing particularly special about me. My, my parents um, were both, they're both now reverends. They, they both went to Yale Divinity School, so they gave us a certain kind of, uh, well, they spoke in, in very complete sentences, let's put it that way. So we were raised with a certain level of intelligence. And, and they did bring us to church very with a lot of dedication, you know, with a lot of discipline. We were brought to church, but they didn't really believe what we were being told in church. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe it either. You know, they were too smart for the fundamentalist uh, Christian thing. And, and they basically, you know, basically they really don't believe any of it. You know, that's the truth. But they brought us for morality, to mm -hmm. learn the, the ways of being a good person. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate that I wasn't raised by fundamentalists. Yeah. Because I think that's much harder to break out of. At least we were, we were given an open mind and the, the, the freedom to question. Mm -hmm. This we were given. The freedom to question baloney and call it what it is. Yeah. Um, to be able to think fine. in a different way. But let, let's yeah. go back to your first, uh, your first experience of spirituality as a young boy. And you said you were at the dentist and you, had, you yeah. were having gas. They gave you gas. And you had this guys, experience. Yeah. How old were you? Well, I don't know. Maybe I was eight or six mm -hmm. or something like that. I'm not sure. Maybe it was seven or eight. Yeah. And uh, 
I had this, I had uh, a rather large gap in between my first, uh, my two front teeth, and they said, we've well, got to cut a tendon that, that keeping the teeth from growing together. So that was what the surgery was about. And they, and they, they gave me laughing gas. And I remember it very distinctly because it was a very powerful experience. I, I, I found myself way out, uh, way out of my body in the universe. and spinning around uh, I think that, that laughing gas brings this kind of dream <laughs> and anyway, so this spinning around in this ecstasy and the, instead of the throbbing of pain the throbbing yeah. was the was the, the the spinning going around this fantastic whirligy ride and I remember looking at my at my human self in the in the dentist chair and, and thinking this is the funniest thing the, uh, the absurd idea that I am the little boy in the dentist Chair. It's so it's so funny because I know now what I am. I am this infinite vastness that is made of bliss, mm -hmm. and I'm so vast and so exquisitely divine, and having so much fun that the idea that I was that little boy in the chair was just hysterical. This is why I was laughing. <laughs> but then it, you didn't follow on. You you carried on using a lot of marijuana and getting a lot of experiences of seeing God all over the place. And Eventually, that's that funny. <laughs> Yes. And then one day you ended up going to your teeth. Uh, oh, you you got into acting, into theatre. This is very parallel yeah. with my life, except I never took drugs. I, with me, it was food. I was a food addict, and but I never saw God. <laughs> I never saw anything. But then you got into theatre, and you got quite serious into theatre. But one day you went to your teacher and you told him you've had enough and you're going to follow the spiritual life you're literally going to leave everything behind and this is what's calling you this spiritual life is that right well yes i had started a, i had been having this sort of spontaneous spiritual awakening with marijuana um well i was having more and more profound experiences of the divinity that is pervading everything and everything i looked at i was like, God and everything I saw, and it was such a powerful thing, and I was like, oh my God, you know, I was having so many powerful experiences, I was just like, I can't do this, and also try to be in a professional theater training program, mm -hmm. it just seems like I have to give myself completely to this awakening, and I want to get out of this, this, uh... Hello? Yeah, I have to stop. Of course. And then you well, discovered A Course in Miracles and uh, Elizabeth Clare Prophet. As I say, my journey is so similar. The Violet Flame and A Course in Miracles, and they're so powerful. So you went to, um, uh, you started to work on the Violet Flame and did the invocations, and you yeah. started to get that sense of peace and being connected to everything through the Violet Flame. Is that right? Well, I, I was, it was useful for me for a while to do those invocations. Um, yeah, uh, shall I give an example? I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet and do like a lone I bow. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am the violet flame. I love it. I was doing some of affirmations and they're powerful. And um, one day I was alone in my little studio apartment in Brooklyn. Now, the same thing, another affirmation the blue flame of the Arduino. I don't know about that one. And um, the, the door of my oven yeah, you took to blew that. open and a tongue of blue flame leapt into the room three feet long. That and is a real time. manifestation. Yes, it was Scary a fantastic manifestation. manifestation. <laughs> I love wow, that. Wow, wow, what was that? Like a I, love, I love the way everything in the book is, manif is, is showing you something. You know, like Greg Braden talks about the world around us, whatever happens to our cars or anything is manifesting what's going on inside us and is a sign in some way of our journey. I love the story about the jacks, that you found a jack in the car and, and, and you know, all the, whenever anything goes wrong, you always realize that th what, there is no wrong. Wrong is only there in order to show us the light. And, you know, it's all, of course, in miracles and very, very yeah. similar to everything that I'm learning myself. So, um, so go on then. So you got into the violet flame and the blue flame. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I was scared yeah, of this. And I was also doing psychotherapy. I mean, this was very important for me at a certain stage. It kept me from, it, it, it helped me, tr you know, uh, find my way out of uh, my craziness and keep me from committing suicide and finally uh, led me to spirituality. It was, it was that bridge between um, my crazy spirituality and my sane spirituality. It was psychotherapy, so that was very helpful. It helped me. Mm. And you were very, very okay. lucky. You're very lucky that your parents were determined to keep you out of the asylums. <laughs> Absolutely. When you were going through all this. Absolutely. Yes, I was. So, I really have been blessed with amazing parents, and they were very, very. Um, they were very kind to to walk with me through my craziness, even when I was very angry at them and blaming them for everything. They they did their best to keep me out of mental hospital. Mm. And keep me uh, and pay for my therapy. I mean, they paid just so much money for my to keep me keep me insane. And so I'm very grateful for that. They, yeah. they deserve angels' wings, I'm sure. So you found a spiritual counselor that was that believed in you, that believed that what yes. you were going through was spiritual awakenings, That's rather right. than she stick you She understood drugs. spirituality. She knew the Course in Miracles. She knew God, and so and she knew about reincarnation. So these were these. Suddenly, I had found someone who could understand what I was going through because previously it was like I was the only one in my entire world who knew anything about what I was going through and it put me in a very sort of strange position because the knowledge I was receiving was so potent and so true that everybody around me thought I was just crazy. They, they didn't understand it. So to find someone wise who understood the basics and, and confirmed for me what I was going through but helped me sort of find the right context for it, this was very good, very beneficial. Now I, I love your little anecdotes of, of going crazy. The bit about uh, God taking your marbles, polishing them, and giving them back to you—that that, that <laughs> is so amazing. Because I have yeah. also got a mental illness, um, and half the people in in the UK are being diagnosed. And I think it's really important to show them, you know, the, the, all the, these beautiful anecdotes of yours. That they that made me laugh. That reminded me of Peter Pan. Um, with I can't remember his name, but he, he keeps losing his marbles. One of the characters. Ah, <laughs> oh, I can't remember his name, but but that touched me, and you know all the nutcases that you say come to Alma and everything. But anyway, moving on. How, yeah. Why Alma? I mean, how did you get into that? How how were you attracted to her ashram and everything? Well, I met. Ama in 1987 when she first came to the USA and um, it's kind of a long story but uh, you know um, someone had I, I went to a Buddhist center and told them I was interested in becoming a monk even though I was I was living with a woman at the time in you know very uh, my first good um, girlfriend yes but I so I told this 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 um, she was actually a Zen nun. I told her I want, really wanted to go to India and become a monk. And she said, oh, there's a saint coming from India. Why don't you come and meet her to our, in, a, in a couple of months? She's coming to our center in Boston. So I went to Boston, and um, there's you know this, this little brown woman up on stage singing this devotional music, and it was very powerful music. And then afterwards, people were going up in this little line to receive a hug from her. I thought, well, this is really funny. So, uh, you know, I got in the queue, and I'm, I'm just, I get like three people away from, from her, this is Anna, the husband saying, I start feeling this, this heat in my body, like this divine energy that seems to be coming from her. And I'm, oh, this is pretty bizarre, what is going on here? So then I'm, I come up here, and she gives me a very beautiful, intimate hug, and she dips her finger in sandal paste, and puts it here on my, on my forehead for just a few seconds, and looks right in my eyes, and it's very sweet. And I get this flash of lightning in my brain. And I eat the piece of chocolate that she gave me, and I'm yeah, the still seeing lightning the flashing through my brain, and I'm like, well, this is really something, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I was like, you know what, I better stay up all night and see her again the next day. And someone told me, oh, there's an opportunity to ask her questions. So I said, well, let me ask her about becoming a monk, you know? So, so I stayed overnight in my car, and um, called in this, called into work sick the next day, and then went to the next program, and um, 
all night long, my the, my brain was filled with these flashing lightning bolts. I wasn't sleeping well because I just apparently from the touch of the I had this light show going on in my brain. I was like, this is not an ordinary human being. I don't know what what exactly we have here. But so then the next day, there were about thirty five people in the room. It was you know her first year there, and I I thought to myself, well instead of going right up for the first time. Why don't I sit here and just watch everybody going and imagine that I'm the one in just going up for the hug. So this way I can have 35 hugs. Yeah. So I sat there watching and imagining all these hugs and after about 15 minutes I'm going into a very beautiful bliss state having all these hugs in my imagination. Now when I finally get up to Amma for my own hug, she looks at me and she sees the same old face mark from the night before because I hadn't even had the sense to wash my face. <laughs> let alone take a shower, and she looks at me and says, oh, I already had Darsha. <laughs> this is as if, oh, you're trying to sneak in for seconds, what is this? <laughs> and I, I said, no, no, this is from last night. She said, oh, okay, okay. And, and she said, she could hug anyway, but sort of give me a suspicious look. And, and afterwards I thought, well, you know, if she didn't really know, if she really didn't know that she hadn't that she hadn't hugged me already that morning, well then, this is not my guru, because I know my guru, whoever it is, is, you know, one with God, omniscient, never misses anything. <laughs> but maybe she was actually telling me that she knew that I had been out there imagining that I was receiving 30 hugs, and though, therefore she mm. had already given me a hug. Yeah. And that was the truth of the matter, but it was too much for me to grasp. It was, yeah. she's too subtle. She's, you know, you would be expecting someone who's there uh, as a saint, to be sort of showing off the divinity, right? Be sort of impressing everyone with how omniscient she really is. You wouldn't mm -hmm. expect them to be actually hiding and, and sort of pretending not to know something that she obviously did know. This was more than I could understand, you know? Mm -hmm. She was actually testing whether I had the wisdom to see through her disguise mm -hmm. into the goddess that is right within that disguise. And this is still the case with her. She's, she really embodies the Divine Mother of the universe. She embodies omniscience and infinite love. So she sees, she sees into people's souls and she knows Absolutely. exactly what they need to learn. So she's able Absolutely. to give you that message. Is that what you mean? That's absolutely right. In other words, she's, well, you know, the, the, the image, one of the images I like to use to understand Amma is that she's like the infinite ocean of consciousness. And each one of us is like a little wave on that ocean. Mm. And she appears to be just another wave. But mm. there is no ego in her. There is no barrier between her human self and the entirety of that mm. infinite ocean. So she and this is already within each one of us. So she, the ocean is already within all the waves. So she knows all about us. She knows everything about us. So when we come before her, you know, we're, we're like... She sees, uh, she sees her own self and she sees everything we've been through. She knows every mm. moment that we've lived and she, she, you know, we are herself, we are her beloved children. So I, in a way, it's um, when you talk about the healings that she's done, the people with cancer have gone and been hugged and, you know, and been healed. It's very much like Jesus, that Jesus uh, never saw anything but health and love. And of course, Course in Miracles tells us that there is no death, there is no illness, there is no disease. So in all, so she's on that same vibration, that's what you're saying. That she Absolutely. is on the same vibration that Jesus and Buddha and all these, you know, higher beings that we aspire to, to, to our brothers and sisters, as, as Jesus would like to say in the Course of Miracles, and I like that. And so yes. she's on that same vibration where you say in the book, and from the time she was born, more or less, she was meditating. <laughs> that she was already meditating, yes. and, and in yeah, she was born. She was it. born with the knowledge that only God is real. Mm. She was, you know, she was born with that, and she was born with a smile on her face, and she, she didn't cry when she was born. And mm. you know, within six months, she was walking. So this, she was a very full little uh, baby. <laughs> she was, she was a, no, she was a divine incarnation. And no doubt, for me, that's the truth. Although she does not get up and declare, I am a divine incarnation, I am going to save you. She doesn't and she do completely that at all. She just simply says, I'm your servant, and I'm your mother, and I'm a, I'll help you, I'll give you compassion. And she's, she demonstrates what she is by her daily life. You've watched her for just two days, and you can't, be, mm -hmm. you can't help but be amazed and impressed by this is divinity in action. So she completely 
completely turned your life around. I mean, forgive me if I say this, because I'm talking about myself here, um, that I started out, as I say, I had an eating disorder, and then I went on to the stage, and then I, in a way, um, I got addicted to lots of other things. And up until nearer the end of the book, it feels like you're addicted to her. You're addicted to her hugs. You can't live without the hugs. And then suddenly you realize, hang on a second, that's not what I'm, that's not it. She's everywhere. You know, she, she's that consciousness, that love. And she, you felt that it was touching you everywhere you went. So you didn't need to be with her physical body you knew that she was everywhere and that's when that realization must have happened that you don't need to be addicted anymore because it was yeah, everywhere there's, 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 I mean, there's the, the addiction to the guru's presence is the, the addiction that heals you of all other illnesses and then finally you know you're set free from that addiction as well it's mm. like you're you revealed it's revealed to you that, that of course, the guru was on the present, and the guru was actually the true self. Mm. So, uh, you, fi you know, finally everything falls away, but the supreme reality, which is your own true being, not some, not something that you're getting from someone else. It's not like that. But the guru embodies that supreme reality who you truly are. Mm. And so, contact with the guru of whatever kind, devotion to the guru, it leads you to the discovery of your own true nature as being one with God. Mm. So then, you don't need anything. Else. You, then you become one who sheds light to, to other beings, you know. Um, but the, the, the grace of the Guru and contact with the Guru can lead you to that state. She, so to she's, state a, yeah, she's able to manifest that consciousness that we call pure love, that Jesus talks about in The Course in Miracles, yeah. like he's in the, on, on that vibration. And she never leaves that state. That's my, my experience of her, that she's, just, she's established in that so fully and so permanently that the, her vessel is always overflowing. Mm -hmm. She goes 20 hours a day and you know sleeps for one hour or two hours and is back the next day to do the same exact thing. And while she's giving these, these hugging programs, she's also running a huge charitable network. Yes, that, I love, that, I love that's what amazing, you mm. Amazing work all around the world, and especially in India. But wherever there's a natural disaster in the world, she will send a team of volunteers, she will send money, clothes, food, medicine. Um, and, you know, even, even a million dollars she gave to the victims of Hurricane Katrina in the USA. This is yeah. from India. You know, um, but... You talked about yes, tsunami yes. and all of that. But you talked yes. about tsunami that she supports um, a lot of the families. And, and you were actually in that. You were actually there when it happened, when the tsunami happened? Yes, I was there. My wife and I were there when the tsunami hit. We were up, we were up on the 10th floor uh, in our apartment in the ashram, and we didn't even realize what had happened. But maybe it was only half an hour after the tsunami had come in that I went out of the balcony and saw, oh my, what's going on? The river is full of all this garbage and all. Walk from the boat. From what happened? And I thought maybe somebody up river had dumped a whole bunch of junk into the river. Um, but uh, one of our neighbors said, "Oh no, didn't you hear that was tsunami? And there's another wave coming." You know, and, um, and then I, I go running down and I see, wow, the ocean is full of grief. Uh, I'm losing you. wading yeah. through the water, giving, oh, giving yeah. urgent instructions to her disciples. To, um, to go out running into the community to, to mm -hmm. save anybody they can save because you know people drowned in, in the area. Yeah. There were something like six deaths in the, in the peninsula where the ashram was located. No, none of Amma's devotees died, but there were people who were living in the community who um, did suffer very much. And so there were old people trapped in buildings. And oh. So her disciples come running out to take care, and, uh, and she had everybody come across the river into her university campus. So she gave shelter to the whole community. Mm -hmm. um, and in immediately started giving three meals a day to everybody and shelter to anybody who needed it. And then they started immediately to build uh, a new set of shelters for anybody who had lost their homes. Mm -hmm. And this was, these shelters were completed within three days. And, uh, you know, 
was the, the government, because of the usual red tape, was really not able to do much. They were just work doing and, you know, politicizing everything, but nobody not doing anything. And so Amma was able to immediately go and do what was necessary. And, you know, we were out there serving food. Mm. Uh, there were, I don't know, maybe tens on the work of local villages to come and get three meals a day. Mm-hmm. And we were participating in that. And, and uh, doctors were there. Amma has a hospital right, right at the ashram and also a very big and excellent hospital a few hours away. And so doctors had come and they were setting up free medical clinics for everybody. And, um, but for yourself, that must have been a really frightening experience going through all of that. You know, I wasn't frightened, you know, but um, I mean, for the, God knows, for the villagers who lost their family members, it was horrifying, yeah. you know, I mean, the mothers lost their babies, and, you know, children lost their parents, and it was horrifying, you know, there's the videos, I mean, one of the things the Ashram did was set up a, a mass funeral where all the bodies would be burned, and they could, you know, the last yeah. rites that everybody could be given, mm-hmm. and, and it's, it's pretty sad, you're watching the, you know, the a coffin with a little baby in it of a young boy who has to do the funeral for his father who died, you know. Mm-hmm. So, of course, it's horrifying. And, and um, one of the things that Amma did, one of the many things, um, was there were mothers who lost their only children in the tsunami. And um, Amma, and, and these, these were ladies who had had their tubes tied to prevent further births. Mm-hmm. And then they lost their only children. So what Amma did was she asked for main hospital to give these ladies new operations to untie the tubes and make it possible for them to give yeah, birth again. Yeah, wonderful. And so there's yeah. some interviews with these ladies who have been able to give birth again and the gratitude that they're here. So, I mean, well, the thing I, I really would love to ask is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very open-minded about everything and I believe in the power of love. I, I believe in prayer. I believe that we can heal anything, especially if we don't see the illness, as I said, uh, in anyone. Um, But why do we not know about her? I mean, I have heard about her on and off, about the hugging saint. But there are so many people that are sick and dying and in the Western world. And and yet, why is it not out there? You know, do do you understand what I mean? What's stopping all of this getting out there because we need and also the other question was can she train people to do what she does with whatever she can she actually get people to that level where I obviously you're doing it with your book and you know I'm doing it with my TV station I'm hoping you know to make people happy and to raise the vibration and do the opposite of what the media is doing you know to show us yeah uh, which is showing us what we're not anymore. But what I'm trying yeah. to say is we need more ways of getting out there to the ordinary person that's walking up and down the street here and explaining to them that you don't have to suffer. So does she run training programs of any kind where she trains people up? Uh, I know you didn't get accepted well, as a no. monk, but... And she laughed. Well, in a way, her ashram, her ashram is like that. It's not, it's not, she's not training us all to go out and give hugs to everybody, but mm-hmm. she's training us to, to attain, to attain the state of God realization. And that's the ultimate goal of life and the goal for all of us, to attain that state of merging in God, where we can become pure instruments of the divine. Mm-hmm. But it's not, it's not such an easy, it's not such an easy goal to attain. It's, it's something that may take lifetimes to attain. You know, saints are rare. They're few and far between, and divine incarnations are even fewer. And, you know, so I would be lucky if I can actually become a saint in this lifetime. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a fantastic quest, and I do my best to, to meditate every day and to mm-hmm. do my best to merge and to become one with God. But it's a slow process. I can certainly testify that it's not so easy to suddenly become a saint, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, that's, what she, that's one of the things that she's offering me. The only thing for really wants to attain that realization when you come and serve. Learn the ways of purity and divinity and do your best. And, you know, by in serving the Guru and, and becoming part of this mission where she's creating a tremendous amount of good karma, by contributing, you gain some of that karma for your own spiritual quest. Mm-hmm. So, that is definitely one aspect. And the other aspect is, you know, uh, 
Just some, don't wait to become God realized. Start serving now at whatever level you're at. And you're yeah. doing a beautiful job with your TV station. That's you know, exactly that. Whatever light you have, bring that candle out and shine it because the world desperately needs people who are willing to speak up for spirituality and speak up for love and, sh and bring. That, that actually came across so strongly for me. I woke up this morning and I sent you that email because I was very depressed yesterday um, uh, because I was too stuck in what comes next and how and what. And, and I just yeah. came in today with an open heart and metaphorically was hugging everyone. And it was so powerful to be able to do that thanks to the book and thanks to you know what came up inside of me, which was amazing. Yeah. We just go out there and do the work and, and just see what happens. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Mm. I mean, everybody's got their song to sing, you know, and I think you're, you're singing your song beautifully. And it, the, more, the more that we do this, the more beautiful the song becomes. When we have the courage to step out and share our truth and speak up for God, speak up for light and love, you know, and, and contribute in whatever way we can, the world becomes more beautiful. Mm. And, but, you know, God knows, you know, the, the internet is an amazing tool for light and love if we use it that way, but it's also an amazing tool for the powers of darkness that want to yeah. confuse us and But then you know, it's, the parts of garbage. So, but then it's, so we, have to, we have to speak up even more clearly now. But then it's you a know, beautiful way. Don't worry about it. Sorry, it's, it's beautiful the way you open the book with the darkness. And then as the book unfolds, we understand that the darkness is only there in order to bring in the light. It's there to it's the opposite. So it shows us yeah. what we are not anymore. What we're not anymore. I had this yes. conversation with ultimately, someone about angels ultimately, today. You know, ultimately it's all God's play. And so to be able to see God's play within the light and the dark, and therefore love everybody without how you discriminate and you're not worthy of love. No, everyone is worthy of love. Everything is worthy of love. Mm. And we keep rising higher and higher in that love until we see that there's really nothing but love. Mm. And then we embody that love that shines out to everybody. I mean, this is... It was cool. like, when I was reading... It's like you know, it was like you were looking inside me as well. And uh, the, the way you, you describe when we have an awakening, it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm so amazing. And then this beggar walks into the house, into this room, and they're sleeping on the streets. They got no food, no money, and they're sleeping right. in the cold. And I couldn't do that. And it's suddenly, yeah. oh, total humility, you know. And I love the way you describe that in the book. I also like um, the way you say that you do these amazing meditations, and it's like, wow, I'm so in there. And then the next day, boom. <laughs> <laughs> You're right back again. Do the, you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> we're human like, beings. It's like that, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. You have to yeah. keep going and going and going. So that's yeah, that's right. That's right. You have to just persevere and keep surrendering uh, to the Supreme Being and have faith. And no, you know, you have to walk through some hard times. Brilliant. It's not, and easy. It's not an easy path. Not an easy path. And it's not an easy path, but it is. It's, the path of devotion is very sweet, you know, and we have that love, we have that, even that love carries us through the dark moments. So you, you said there's, there's a possibility, there's a big possibility now of a film, I can see that. It's so obvious, you know, it's so visual, the whole thing. So who's going to play you? Who would you like to play you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We have to find the next young Brad Pitt, you know? it's got to be... <laughs> I, and hopefully Oprah can play Amma. Um, Oprah can play, of course, Amma, yeah. How, how old is Amma, by the way, in, in, in mortal years? I think Amma is 62 is years really? old. Is she really? She doesn't yeah. look it at all. Yeah. And, and still going, I mean, all night long and do these programs that, you know, it's just superhuman energy. There's no doubt that no, she's, not a, she's not a human being. There's something much, much more powerful working through her. And, you know, I was I was sitting with Amma in India a couple of months ago in one of these programs she does in India where she's giving hugs to 40,000 people a day. Uh, one of the Indian programs are huge, you know, and she goes all day, on a break, maybe she'll take a five minute break, but still, but you're looking at something absolutely incredible. And the amount of bliss that gets generated and the amount of devotion that gets generated in these programs is just, is palpable. You know, you can really feel, wow, she's just uplifting 
so many people in one day. Joy the joy that's generated is amazing. Um, um, it just occurred to me really deeply, well, you know, this has never really been done before in history. There have been many masters, of course, there have been uh, great saints, and there have been divine incarnation, there have been Buddha, and there have been Jesus, and there have been Krishna, and many others, but nobody has ever before given 30 million hugs. 30 million You know, it's months. something new. This is like, it's like so, so completely accessible. I mean, there are great masters, but you can't. It's very fun. It's very fun. You know, you, you, you maybe see them for five minutes a day or something like that. So it's very rare to find a master at all. But a master who you can hug every day? 30 million. A master who is just in with the masses, giving everything. Things. She can't uplift everyone. I mean, there's no limit. It's just like a, this is something new. It's, although, of course, it's the same essence as Jesus and Buddha and Krishna. But this is something, I mean, you know, this is something extraordinary. It's something really extraordinary. Oh, I'm thrilled to be connected. As I say, it's completely changed your life. And, uh, you know, you've had a completely different journey to the one that you thought you were going to have. <laughs> So, um, oh, absolutely. And um, so you've written, um, you've written quite a few children's books as well. And uh, do you do you think you might be writing another one now um, about, uh, you know, for adults, or are you going to stop for a little while and take a breather and <laughs> just relax? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I'm not somebody who writes every day. I write when I get the inspiration and I feel sort of an inner command from Amma to write this book and I get I get the clue and I go, okay, I'll start. But otherwise, I do that kind of meditation. You know, um, that for me is the priority, is that, is that making a direct effort to attain God realization, not just sitting meditating. But so I don't know what will happen. I do have a couple of other children's books that are in the hands of artists. The, the text is finished, and then the artist, but to get the artist to come up with 25 paintings is not such an easy thing. Mm. So we'll see, well, when the art is finished, then I'll jump on the designing the book and editing the art and get putting it together. But it's, it's up to God to see, you know, whether God really wants to finish that out or not. I don't know. Well, this is and as far as I'm I don't know. At this point, I'm really happy to have the time to meditate. Mm -hmm. The possibility of having the having the book made into a film. I mean, that would be fantastic. That's so, going to be very exciting. That would be awesome. Very exciting. Because as the, the best wisdom I have is really in in this book. You know, so to be able to bring this to the world in a big way would be a great blessing. It, it, it's wonderful. I think the message every child should be brought up with the knowledge from the Course in Miracles and. The philosophies that we don't, you know, you're never upset for the reason you think, and what you think is bad, you know, there is no such thing as bad and good, and we don't know the meaning of anything, and that everything that happens that we think is a negative is actually leading us to enlightenment, and it's just so incredible. It's like turning the world is completely upside down in that teachings changing all our yeah. beliefs around and I think children would benefit a hell of a lot if they were brought up with those philosophies rather than the beliefs we are brought up with that cause us so much yeah. suffering because we're so yeah. attached to what we think is right and mm. yeah no, I fully agree and that the, the opportunity to share high knowledge with the world is there and we should take it Whenever we can, whenever we can, we should be able to spread light and wisdom that, that, that uh, liberates. And there is that truth, and the truth is liberating. Mm. But boy, it's hard to find in the modern world. You know, it's, it's there, but there's so much junk, and the media is so strong and so attractive and so hypnotizing. With you know all the stuff that draws us into ignorance. Yes, and, um, yes. So we, that's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm trying to counteract. I'm trying to create a positive media, a media where everyone is important and give everybody back the positive, the um, self-esteem and show them that the media is trying to show them all the time depression and violence and everything they're not. And I'm trying to show them the opposite. And 
Just, just very quickly, so how did you meet Russell Brand? That must have been a bit of an experience. Where, how did you meet him and how did that all, how, all that happen? Say this again, the question. How did you meet Russell Brand? How did you meet him? Oh, how did that happen? Yeah, he was, he was at Amma's Ashram at New Year's. Oh, uh, right. Year. He's, uh, he's met Amma several times and I guess he's becoming more and more uh, a devotee of Amma. Mm. And so he, he was at the Ashram, I heard he was there. And then I was, I happened to be sitting right next to Amma while she was giving her darshan program. And I see Russell Brand came up to receive a mantra from Amma, and I was sitting right next to him, right next to this. And a little light bulb went off in my head. Wow, I bet he would really love my book. Because he also went through, of course, you know, major drug issues, and, and now he's awakening spirituality in a very good way. So. And, and of course, it's hysterically funny. And my book is also really funny, so I thought, oh, this is really a good match. I thought he would love this. And he also looks so like Jesus. Up, I, I, I wrapped up my book. <laughs> Sorry, and, I was just going to uh, say, he also looks like Jesus. <laughs> There's both of you. Yeah. Like, you know, I've been, you know, with your long hair, and uh, people thought you were Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and he's got this show called the Messiah Complex. <laughs> so, I this. Messiah complex, and I, I wrote a book. Speaking of the Messiah complex, honey, I really had one. <laughs> so I wrapped it up in a, in a piece of paper and, and brought it to him and gave it to him and gave him a big hug. We had a beautiful, long hug, and I said something like, "You're so beautiful. Thank you for setting us all free." Because I love the way I love his freedom. This is the one thing he does embody: is the complete freedom to be whatever he is and say whatever he wants to say yeah. in that moment and behave any way he wants. And I love that. I just think that's fantastic. It's a total stream Especially, of consciousness, you know, isn't in it? In the context mm. of divinity. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's very path, lucky. You know, that's, they... that's my path as well: is bringing out whatever is within you and seeing the divinity within everything, and without fear. You know. Mm. Mm. And so um, we had a beautiful moment of connection and the next couple of days later I'll have get posted on Twitter and on Facebook a photo of himself reading the book and to something like 11 million people. Wow. <laughs> so this was rather fantastic. That's but, brilliant. Um, so, so just to, to um, finish, uh, if people want to get the book, um, how can they get it? Because all the proceeds are going to the orphanage in Kerala. Um, and that's embracingtheworld.org, which is Amma's website. Is that, that's right. And um, yes. all the all the proceeds. Yeah, so all, all, the, all, the, all the royalties. Yeah, all the royalties are going to Amma's orphanage. And the right. website where you go to find the book is www.rising-inlove.org. Okay. Rising-inlove.org. Okay, and you can actually download the ebook. Or you can get the physical book on Amazon, is that right? Right. Here's the book. Uh, it's a lovely, um, nice pack. 300 pages. Really nice book. Um, so, yes, it's available on Amazon from, from that website. rising And okay. all the royalties are going to Amazon. So, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful service project. Well, it's wonderful. It's a really good thing that you're doing. And um, it's been very exciting interviewing you. Thank you so much. Oh, and no, um, when you get to England, look me up. You must come and visit. I'd love to meet you. Thank you. I've never been to um, India yet, but if I do get to, I would love to know. I'd love to meet Amma and experience her hug. I mean, from my point of view, as I say, from my meditations this morning, I started to meditate on her sending me some hugs. Um, because I tried to explain to you about the word in Hebrew, Ima, is mother. Uh -huh. And Alma okay. feels like I am mother. And it's what I've been craving, <laughs> is that, you know, that motherly hug, that nurturing. And as I think the whole world needs that at the moment. We need a big, yeah. massive um, maternal hug. Well, you know, Anna comes to London every year. She comes in, okay. in sometime in October, November. Somewhere there's about six weeks where she's in Europe every year. So she comes to London for three days. Oh, and I think every other every other year she goes to uh, Ireland also, to Dublin. 
And um, everything is free, isn't it? You see, this is beautiful. The, the program is free. free. The hug the is free. free. And um, there are the retreats, retreats, which she does maybe like, like, like during the six week US tour, there are three retreats or four retreats. And the retreats cost something, but not very much. It's basically right. the same thing. I think it's so important because, uh, you know, one of the things is we have a beautiful Amaravati Buddhist temple near us. And, and people go there who have nothing and they can have food and they can stay there and there's not enough of that in our world. So I think, you know, whatever we can give from the heart, I do a lot of bartering, you know, bartering skills and stuff like that. So whatever we can do from the heart, then I think it's really, really important. So yeah. thank you so much. That was beautiful. And uh, Thanks, it's like, um, <laughs> Namaste. No, I should tell you one more thing, which is that yeah. um, the website to find out more about Alma and more about mm -hmm. her, her teachings and her mission and her tours is www.ama.org. A-M-A-A.org. And there's also ama-europe.org. Ama-europe.org. And there they have, a, you can find a specific website for, the, for her organization in the UK. Okay, that's wonderful. Right. So, thank you very much for that, Randas. So I'm thank going to end so the much interview much. there. But I, I just send you a big hug, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Pardon? I send you a big hug. Thank you. But what I was also <laughs> going to say, if you can give a donation to Moving On TV, I'll be very grateful. I have to ask everyone, because that's the only way we survive. So let me know if that's a possibility. I'll be very grateful. All right. I surely will. I surely will. Okay, then. Lots of love. Thank oh, you. Bye-bye. Namaste. Bye-bye.